I'm not sure. Yeah. So we are live now, I think. Hi. <laughs> All right, Aisha, thank you so much and welcome to live chat with Josie. Um, thank you so much. I mean, I will say a million thank yous for accepting my invitation. No. No need. No, no. It's, it's a huge pleasure to, to be with you. And um, thank you. Thank you for starting my Friday off in, in such a lovely way. Okay. And, um, you know, like I told you, I took up journalism because of you. You are a great inspiration to me. And I'm sure there are a lot of mil a million girls in Africa that look up to you. Oh, that, that's very kind of you to say that and very humbling. Um, I, I can only speak for myself, you know, it wasn't a journey that I undertook with a thought to what it might mean for other people who are working, but I am really incredibly touched and, and I'm really, really humbled by the fact that the work I've done has inspired other women of color, other young girls you know, in the developing world who want to take up journalism. And together, we will make things better, again, all of us. Absolutely. Absolutely. So it's a culture on my show. I know I know a lot about you from what I've read. Um, and obviously, you were once the face of CNN, BBC, Sky. Um, I would want to ask you to introduce yourself to our viewers tonight. Sure. Hi, everyone. My name is Aisha Sase. I am a journalist. I'm an author. Um, I'm also an activist for women and girls around the world. Um, and I'm currently the host of Home with Aisha Sase, a weekday show streaming on Facebook, looking at the coronavirus pandemic. As so um, you initially wanted to become an actress. So at what point did you change your mind and what instigated the change? Um, I, I wanted to be an actress in my teens, and uh, by the time I got to university in the UK, that, that changed. I became far more uh, interested in using my voice for advocacy and became more interested in, in writing for the college newspaper and just generally having an impact became far more important to me or certainly trying to make the lives of my fellow students better became um, a priority. So I went to Trinity College, Cambridge, uh, which is the largest of the Cambridge colleges. Um, the co Cambridge University is made up of 31 colleges. And, uh, and uh, Trinity is the largest of them. And it was heavily male um, and disproportionately male, white, and wealthy. And I felt that um, there were little students particularly female students who didn't have a didn't have a voice who were uncomfortable within the, the student community. And anyway, I got there and, and found a lot of things that I was unhappy with and decided that I wanted to work on changing them. And as a result, my desire to act kind of fell away. But would you still take up acting if the opportunity comes your way? I mean, I'm, I'm, a, I'm an incredibly adventurous person and so would never say no if the opportunity felt right or was interesting um, or worthwhile. So I think that's a long way to Maybe for the right, for the right role, the right, the right director, the right production, who knows? <laughs> yes, okay. And you were once at BBC, Sky, and then CNN. In your own opinion, which is the media organization would you describe as the most challenging? It's hard to make a comparison because I was at, I was very different times of my career, right? So it, it's hard to say the, the, the challenges I faced at BBC came with being new to the industry. Um, the challenges I faced being at Sky came with the fact that I was at Sky Sports and wasn't naturally um, a sports journalist. Um, the challenges came with, with, with being at CNN. Uh, again, I was moving to one of the biggest news organizations at, in the world and relocating from England to America and working with, with fellow journalists who had been there for, for decades in cases. So I don't, I don't think you can make a like like comparison in terms of difficulties, because I think that um, 
the difficulties came with where I was in life at, at the time for each place. So I couldn't I couldn't fairly make a comparison. Okay, and you left CNN after 13 years. You cited the media's focus on United States President Donald Trump as a reason for your decision. Do you think uh, President Trump is being unfairly treated by the media? I mean, listen, I also, you know, I think that, that my, my explanation for leaving, people always leave out the other half of what I said, which was not only was I tired of Trump and matters of the United States, but I also had have a not-for-profit that I wanted to focus on. My mother was ill. I wanted to focus on that. I was writing a book. It was, it was, very, it was a combination of things that brought me to that place. But, you know, listen, I won't deny that by the time I left CNN, I was very, very, very tired of the coverage I was I was doing and was not enjoying it anymore. Um, as to whether or not the media is um, treating Trump, I think that... Um, let me just say, I think it deserves scrutiny. I think it deserves scrutiny, and I think this is a worrying time. Um, questions of fairness are, you know, are beyond me. I would just say that he deserves scrutiny. Now, do I think that he should be coming to the exclusion of everything else that is happening in the world? No, I do not. I think there is a lot happening in the world, and that also should be included in coverage. And that is what bothers me more than anything, the exclusion of the rest of the world. Hmm. And when you're at CNN and you had to be on set rec uh, um, reporting on negative stuff on Africa, how did you feel? Uh, listen, the one thing I will, I will, I will defend CNN for after 13 years, and I'm still friends with everybody. I left on very good terms. Uh, I will say that we weren't CNN, for the time I was there. And I can only speak for my coverage um, and the coverage that happened in the network as a whole while I was there. I never was there, but my intention was to tell this to tell a particular story about Africa, particularly bad, challenging, uh, maybe um, disappointing story about Africa with the intention of confirming a bias or a particular narrative about what the continent is like. That was never the intention um, on the part of my editorial bosses and the network. Whole. I never felt that we were we were trying to build one particular narrative about the continent. Um, so, 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 knowing the intention that it isn't about trying to to it in a negative way. When I did come across stories that we had to tell that were, I, I guess, showed Africa in a poor light. Um, most of the time. There were stories that, that had to be told. I am not one for filtering the narrative about Africa. I am one for saying that we need to tell all sides of the story. There's a lot that we do well. There's a lot that we do that is inspiring and incredible and should be highlighted. And a lot of people deserve a lot of praise. Yeah. And then there's stuff that's really, really disappointing. And that stuff needs to be told as well. We need to tell the full, complex story of every other place in the world. Absolutely. So in your career, um, 13 years at CNN, what will you consider as your lowest point and your highest point? Uh, you know, I think you know, in, terms of, in terms of disappointment or in terms of coverage, I mean, I don't know whether it's specifically tied to because I was at CNN or lowest point covering or, or being in the business um, I think specifically if it, if it relates to Africa I was really upset with the coverage around Ebola in 2014 it was really and I was very public about being very disheartened about the way international media um, really presented Africa in a, in, 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 a, in a very particular light of you know, they stripped us of our dignity in terms of the pictures they chose to show of us in terms of, you know, really doubling down on the narrative of white people coming to save us, of really scrubbing out the roles and the participation of Africans themselves in building a response. You know, we were completely, in many places that I looked, and including my own network, and I said that about my own network, kind of expunged 
from the story and it was all about Americans and Brits coming to save us and people ignored the 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 grassroots actors ignored the young people who built checkpoints to make sure people were you know not going where they shouldn't they ignored the the doctors and the nurses in the communities who were who were helped battling this disease I think that was a very very low point, um, for me in terms of international media as a whole um, and then I think, um, you know, high point was was definitely seeing international media led by CNN cover the, the abduction of the Chibok girls and really driving the story to a, a new height and a new level of attention. And you were so heavily involved um, in, obviously, um, the abduction of the Chibok girls campaign. Can you tell us about that? Yeah, I, I mean, for me, it was just a story that, I wanted to make sure it didn't disappear when, I guess, when the sun set, you know, in, in the sense that stories from Africa, sometimes they blaze onto the stage and they get attention for a very brief moment of time and then they disappear. But I felt that, you know, the abduction of 276 girls should not be one of those stories. And also with the understanding of how African, Africa can be. And again, I'm not one for sure quoting um, or, or covering up, you know, after shortcomings or shortcomings that exist in many societies and also exist in ours and in Nigeria, which is, you know, particularly, um, uh, I don't want to say focus, but, you know, questions of money and class and power and influence are, are, are very prevalent in, 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 in a lot of circles in Nigeria and because these girls come from a very poor very marginalized community in the Northeast, far from where anyone of influence came or anything of interest, that they would just be forgotten and cast off as unimportant. And I just thought that it was wrong. I felt it was an injustice. An injustice twice. Injustice that Boko Haram stole them and an injustice that their own society, you know, and people in, of power didn't think that they were worth fighting for. Okay, and then um, you also have a project, um, We Can Lead. Can you take us through that project? Um, what inspired you to do that? Yeah, I mean, We Can Lead is my not-for-profit in Sierra Leone, which we, we've sadly had to put on hiatus for now because of coronavirus and the, the dangers yeah. and, and challenges of operating um, in, in this environment. Um, so it's a not-for-profit that works on growth empowerment. Or, you know, the, the, the ultimate mission is to nurture the leaders, the female leaders of, of tomorrow. So we take in girls at age 13, so high school girls, and work with them um, across their, their years in secondary school to help them um, activate their sense of agency, help them reimagine what is possible, um, provide them with, with, with the tools to fulfill their potential. And uh, again, you know, I'm a child of the continent. I, I grew up in Sierra Leone from seven to 16. Um, my parents are both Sierra Leonean. Uh, I, I have seen the challenges that girls face and how they can be marginalized and their dreams crushed or certainly ignored. And I wanted to, and, and still believe in creating a vehicle that supports girls. To, to, to be all they can be. And so that's why I decided to launch We Can Lead, which has not been easy because it's interesting how internationally and even in Africa, the desire to nurture girls isn't one that people readily jump at. Um, it's, it's interesting you know, what, what are the priorities um, of, of many people and where people think it is worth putting their money. It's interesting. So I've learned a lot. And so we are using this time to to refocus and recalibrate our operations so that we can we can support more girls. And are you also uh, mentoring some girls to take up journalism after you? I'm not doing anything formally. Um, no, not doing anything formally, but certainly you know, using my voice as given the opportunity to, um, and hoping that by the work I do, I am. Um, indirectly inspiring other young girls to, to, to follow in my footsteps, and, and so just using my 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 visibility on my platform in that way. Mm. 
And how was it working with the former first lady, Michelle Obama, on her uh, book, um, Becoming Michelle? I mean, how was it for you? It was, I mean, she's amazing. I first worked with her in um, 2016. Yes, it must, must have been 2016 when we did the film um, together. I've lost all track of time now. But we first did the CNN film together. And so that was the first time we actually were involved in a project. Um, and, and she was she was as magical then as she was when I was with her uh, last year for the, the for the book tour of Becoming. And I was in Paris and Amsterdam with her, and I did the two studio the two two arena interviews uh, there, which was just incredible. I mean, it's, it's a huge. It's a huge honor to, to have been chosen and to do those interviews in front of, I don't know, 15,000 people or whatever in these arenas and get to spend, you know, 90 minutes on stage uh, for two nights in a row interviewing Michelle Obama. It was pretty amazing. It was a real, a real, real honor, incredibly humbling and, you know, just one of the many things that count as a blessing. Mm, well done. Thank you. And, you know, I posted um, the flyer, obviously telling people that I'm going to be hosting Aisha to say a couple of guys are like, is she now available? Is she single now? <laughs> She's not available. No. <laughs> so thank you for the Thank you for the natural, but she's not available. No. <laughs> And what happened with your what happened with your first marriage? Would you want to talk about that? It, like many marriages, I think it's seventy percent of them they end in divorce. So we just followed the statistics. Mm -hmm. And what are your hobbies, um, Aisha? I mean, what do you love doing in your spare time? I mean, after Corona, obviously, um, it's it's a few things we can do right now. But what do you do in your spare time? Um, I mean, right now, obviously, because I'm doing two shows a day. I do Home with Aisha to say which streams live on Facebook. I also do The Bright Side, which is on Instagram, which is a more reflective conversation with celebrities about this moment and how we can evolve and be better as people. So I do two shows a day. So I think the team now, we're up to like 20 people, almost 20 people on the editorial side for the show so i'm fairly busy right now there isn't a lot of downtime but if i'm not if i wasn't locked up um i like to cook i like to be outside i like to go to the movies i like to read um i'm, I'm pretty um low-key in the sense that what i don't like to do which is perhaps easier to do some is i don't like to be at like big parties or out you know, on my spare time, I'm dressed up in makeup, and you know, on my spare time, I'm doing something pretty low key, pretty low key, pretty just chilled out, um, and just happy pottering around. I'm probably at my happiest just pottering. Yeah, well, it's a very big honor for you to spare time for me. I know you're really busy these days, but I won't let you go without saying uh, a few words, especially on coronavirus. A lot of people are watching us right now. What words would you want to say, encourage people to stay at home? What would you want to tell our viewers this evening? I think I, I just want to urge everyone to be mindful of the information they're consuming. There's a lot of bad information out there, a lot of misinformation around uh, coronavirus. And I, I urge people to, 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 to check the sources of the information that they consume, but, but also to take this seriously. I know that we 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 don't want to believe that it's as serious as it is, but it is. And um, I've interviewed a lot of people now who have had it, and done a lot of reading around people who talk about being sick for six, seven, eight weeks um, long after they have officially recovered. And one thing that I do want to say to people is that I'm hearing this line from, from many acquaintances and friends that you know in Africa you know, we have a low mortality rate around this disease which is true lower compared to other places and you know, effectively it doesn't kill us and, and and we're grateful for that I'm very thankful that the, the mortality rate is low but I also want to caution people to say you may not die 
but the lasting impact of the surgery is potentially very severe. And so you could be alive, but with your lung capacity reduced by maybe up to 30, 40%, you could survive the levels of full body inflammation, kidneys, it affects livers, it affects your lungs, it causes brain inflammation, it's causing strokes, it's causing a host of issues. So let's not just take this attitude of, oh, well, you know, I could get it, but I'll survive it. Because what state will you be in when you, quote, unquote, survive it? So let's please take it seriously. Let's wear the masks. Let's stay away from people. Because even if you are well, you can affect somebody else who has an underlying condition. Let's just be responsible. This is a really hard thing that I'm asking. It's hard for me, it's hard for you. But we need to do our part so that we can get to a place where we get a vaccine and hopefully can return to something that approaches normality. So that's all I ask, for people to take this seriously and for people to be careful of the information that they are passing, that they are consuming, and just to stay strong. It's not easy, you know, it's not easy, I know that. But let's just stay strong and let's do our part and take it day by day. All right, absolutely. Thank you so much, Aisha. Thank you for your time. Now I'll leave you to get back. Thank you. Thank you. I've got another show to get ready for. To your work. Um, but thank you very much for joining. You're welcome. Please be safe. Thank you. Okay. <laughs> All right. So take care. Wishing you the best. Take care. Bye, everyone. Thank you. Right. Bye. Thank you. All right. Bye. Okay. Bye.